Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, everybody. Amen. Could you take this, sir? Praise the Lord. I think the battle with my cold has finally come to an end. When it, when, when it breaks, start breaking and you don't feel uh, congested. But this morning I want to talk to you and share with you as, as the songs inferred this morning uh, actually from the heart. But I want to talk about the heart of a servant. What does the heart of a servant look like? All right, we're coming into November and we're coming into uh, the American Thanksgiving, but we're also coming into uh, Christmas. And so what does the heart of a servant look like? Because every ministry or the things that we do, and I want us to understand what ministry is. Ministry is not coming to church and standing in this pulpit or coming to church and being a Sunday school teacher or singing a solo or singing a choir. I'm not talking about just that type of ministry, but ministry is also our daily duties, the things we do every day, all right? The work that we go to every day, the people that we meet every day, that's ministry. We are ministry 24-7, all right? And so no matter what ministry to which you feel the Lord is calling you, Every ministry should be motivated out of a servant's heart. In Jeremiah 17, verse 9, God makes it clear why we sin. And he makes it clear that we sin because it's a matter of the heart. Our heart is inclined towards sin from the time we were born. It is easy to fall into the routine of forgetting and forsaking God. But we can still choose whether or not to continue in that sin. We can yield to a specific temptation or we can ask God to help us resist temptation when it comes. If the ways of blessing and cursing are so clear to us, why would anyone choose to be walking in the path of sin? The cause for such action is in the heart. The choice is made in the heart. The Bible said it is so deceitful that Jeremiah wondered who could even understand. God answered by informing Jeremiah, that he can search the heart and examine the mind. God knows those innermost thoughts and motives that an individual might hide from all others. Therefore, God could justify and render to each person what, in fact, they should have, what their deeds deserve, the motives of their heart, the intents of their heart, why they did what they did. God would have already understood uh, that meaning. So what do we mean when we talk about the heart in ministry? There are some common expressions that are used in relation to the heart. So each one of these expressions can be applied to a person's ministry. Number one, after one's own heart. When th something is said to be after your heart, it means that it's perfectly suited to you. Then number two, from one's own heart. When something is said to be done from the heart, it means that it's done with all sincerity and no hypocrisy. We are not interested in, in putting on a ministry show. We are not interested in acting a part. We want a ministry that comes genuinely from the heart. Then number three, to have at heart. When you say that you have something at heart, it means that you cherish it. 
and you're actually concerned for it. What are you actually concerned or earnestly concerned about? Whatever is at the heart will be the object of your ministry. Whatever you have at your heart, whatever is the top priority in your heart, that will become your ministry. And then number four, to take to heart. When you take something to heart, it means that you take it very seriously. It is not something that you do in a casual way. Our ministry cannot be seen as a casual endeavor. When we go to work from nine to five or whatever time we go to work, it is not just casual. We are going to put 100% of who we are and what we're doing into it. If you put only 50%, then you're going to expect 50% out of it. But many of us don't like the 50% that we get back. And that's because we were only putting half of our heart into it. So our ministry cannot be seen as a casual endeavor. It's very serious. It's like when we get married. It's not just casual. <clears throat> oh, well, we get married. No, we're going to put everything that we have into our marriage. Number five, with all one's heart. Pursuing our ministry cannot be a hobby. Let me repeat that. Pursuing our ministry cannot be a hobby. Do you get up every morning and go and do your work like it's a hobby? No, we don't. There's some seriousness to it. There's some substance to it. We're not going because well, yeah, we get a paycheck. If you're going just for the paycheck, may I recommend to you just stay home. You have to put everything into it and what you're doing. Amen? Amen. <coughs> Why, when we do something with all our heart, we do it with intensity? Thoroughly, completely, we leave nothing open to doing it lightly. Many believers said, well, the Holy Spirit can use us, and he does. I'm not taking anything away from the Holy Spirit using us. But how much do we have to put into it for the Holy Spirit to use us? I think we have to do something. Holy Spirit's using us. What are we doing? Well, I'm going to sit in my chair and just snooze, and the Holy Spirit's going to use me. I don't think so. Okay? I think we have to be active, participant for the Holy Spirit to use us. Matters not if you're driving through Tim Hortons. Or if you're driving through to pick up lunch, like I did for the past couple of days, man, I tell you, food in our house cooking just went through out the window. <laughs> Must be somebody missing. In fact, Pastor Mel said the only reason you're missing me is because the food level hasn't been up. I said, well, that would be one, yeah. He said, I'm going to be happy on Thursday, Wednesday. Food level is going to take a little. Oh, I'm going to get to eat at home again. Now, what are some of the ways that a person can be motivated for ministry? Well, when we talk about our heart, we're speaking about our motives. Because our motives come from there. A motive is something that answers the question why did you do that? It is the need or the desire that causes a person to act or the intent or reason behind an action. 
Motives are often based on a particular purpose of or a particular need in the person doing the action. Our motives determine our attitudes, our responses, and our ability to take criticism and handle pressure. If ye as believers are not walking by faith, coming from the portion of our heart or the motive of our heart that the Lord has given us, we respond to criticism by want to criticize or throw it back at the person who's criticizing. How does that work? Not very well. Because it governs our commitment level an intensity level rather than a specific activity. I've had to say to many people, if you don't like the job, don't do the job. Why would you go to work and not like what you do? Why? What's the purpose of going to work? The purpose is I'm going to give all that is in my heart to do. I'm not just going to be going to work because I have to go to work because that's the only way that I have food. Well, it tells you what type of table that you're going to have because you're not really doing it in good faith. But of course, if you quit your job, I guess you're really not going to be doing things in good faith. So, Psalms 139, 23, and 24 said, we need to allow that God to search our hearts. What is our motive? Why am I doing what I'm doing? Well, I'm doing it because I'm doing it for Elder LeMay. Or I'm doing it because I'm doing it for the deacon. Or I wanted to see what the pastor would say. That psalm said, David said, search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxieties. And see if there's any wicked way in me and lead me in the way of everlasting. Well, the Bible says in Philippians, be anxious for nothing. But in everything by what? Prayer and supplication make your request be known unto God. Right? And the same God that gave you the request is able to fulfill the desire that you have put back to him. So, David says, know my heart. Try me. Know my anxiousness. Show me my anxieties. So God already knows your anxieties, doesn't he? Mm -hmm. And the same precious God that knows your anxieties, do what? Put you in the same area where those anxieties are the highest. Why does he do that? So you can lean on him. So you can trust him. But he, until you get to that place, you've got these anxieties that are just going to mount up. You see, David's hatred for his enemies came from his zeal for God. David regarded his enemies as God's enemies. So his hatred was a desire for God's righteous justice and not necessarily for personal vengeance. <clears throat> Is it all right to be angry at people who hate God? Yes. But we must remember that it's God who will deal with them, Amen. not us. Amen. If we truly love God, then we will be deeply hurt if someone hates him. David asked God to search his heart and mind 
and point out any wrong motives that may have been behind his strong words. But while we seek justice against evil, we must also pray that God's enemies will turn to him before he judges them. David asked God to search for sin and point it out. Even to the level of testing his thoughts. That is one of the reasons why we as believers don't point out each other's sin. We point them to the word of God and allow the spirit of God to bring the evidence before the individuals and show them in his word where they have gone wrong. Man, it, 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 doesn't God do a better job? Because you and I tend to always, man, we mess up, don't we? When we want to point out somebody's fault and we, oh my word, we just get all anxious. I spoke to an individual just this morning. She said, oh, Bishop, she said, I got this long letter. I got to send it because I got to get some steam off. I said, yeah, I can see your ears puffing already. I said, and what, what do you expect to accomplish with your letter? Oh, that the person would see the error of their ways. I said, well, sorry to disappoint you, but they're not going to see the error of their ways until God shows them the error of their ways. Amen. And it's not going to come through your flesh letter. Mm. I said to her, I said, ma'am, I said, did you see what the disciples did when they told them not to preach? The government wrote a letter and said, we don't want you to preach in the name of Jesus. And they took the letter and went before God and said, God, you see what they said. You see what they wrote. But we'll rather trust you than obey man. I said, you don't want your sister to, to turn to Christ. <laughs> you don't want her to come to Christ and have to put that letter that you sent in the flesh before him. Now you be troubled. And immediately she said, yep, yeah, you're right. I'm glad I could call you and talk to you. I said, well, I appreciate it being here this morning. All right. So David asked God to search and not only search, but do an exploratory surgery for sin. Go through every area, every motive. How are we to recognize sin unless God points it out? We can't depend on our brother or sister to point it out. They're, they're struggling with the old, they're struggling with issues in their own life. So we, we ask God to point it out. So either God points it out by exposing it fully, or he allows repentance, even in the exposure. So that when God shows us, we can repent and be forgiven. Now, if we were to make this verse our prayer, search us, O oh God, know our hearts. If you were to ask the Lord to search your hearts and your thoughts to reveal sin, the Bible says you are continuing on the path of everlasting life. A person that could be motivated by selfishness and personal ambition. Let's look at Matthew chapter 6, verse 1 to 6, and allow me to read it, if you please, from the Message Bible. Be especially careful when you are trying to do be good so that you don't make a performance out of it. It might be a good it might be good theater, but the God who made you won't be applauded. When you do something for someone else, don't call attention to yourself. Oh my. You've seen them in action. I'm sure, play actors I call them, 
treated prayer meeting and street corner alike as a stage, acted compassionate as long as someone is watching, played to the crowds. They get applause. Oh, look who they look how they are. True, but that's all they get. When you help someone out, don't think about how it looks. Just do it. Quietly and without fanfare. That is the way God, who conceived us in love, working behind the scenes, helps us out. And when you come before God, don't turn that into a theatrical production either. Oh boy, did you see how they worship today? Do you think God sits in a box seat? Here's what I want you to do. Find a quiet, secluded place so you won't be tempted to role play before God. Just be there as simple and honest as you can manage and the focus will shift from you to God. And you will begin to sense his grace. End of reading. When speaking of the scribes and Pharisees, Jesus said, but all their works they do to be seen of men. When we go to our jobs, when we go to our workplace, do we do work to be seen of men? Or do we do our work as seen by men? our Heavenly Father. So that when people see the works that's done, they give glory. I mean, li listen to this. Isn't it a strange action when your employer says, I know that this job is open for you, but please don't apply for it because we like you where we like what you're doing, what you represent to us. When your boss says that about you, it says who's working through you. And he was able to say, but God is going to work through me in this area too as well. Yes. That's why that one opened up. Yeah, there you go. Now, the Pharisees loved the chief seats. They loved the titles. They wanted to make sure when they did a charitable deed, they had everybody's attention. Please look at me. I'm about to tell you what I did. Ain't it just wonderful? And the Bible said that's all the praise they get. To please or to impress men. Galatians chapter 1 verse 10. Am I now trying to win the approval of men or of God? Or am I trying to please men? If I were still trying to please men, I would not be a servant of Christ. The servant of God is constantly tempted to compromise in order to attract and please men. Listen to this, folks. Paul was not a politician, he was an ambassador. His task was not to play politics, but to proclaim a message. And these Judaizers, on the other hand, were compromisers who mixed the law and grace, hoping to please both Jew and Gentile, but never asking whether or not they were pleasing God. How could you as a servant of the living God do not want to please the one who called you into ministry in the first place? You're just interested in serving the individual. To have power and authority over people. Matthew 20. They were open to please both Jew and Gentile. But because Jesus called them to himself, 
and said, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over you. Commonel. And those who are great exercise authority over them. Yet it shall not be so among you. But whoever desires to become great among you, let him be your servant. The Jewish people of that day believed that riches were an evidence of God's blessing. Wow, I thought I heard that in this day. There are some people just believe because you have riches. It's God's glory. It's, oh, Lord, I thank you. But I don't think so. But that's just me. Because they based on the promises God gave the Jewish nation at the beginning of their history. It is true that God did promise material blessing if they obeyed and material loss if they disobeyed. That's found in Deuteronomy 26 to 28. But in the infancy of the race, the only way God could teach them was through rewards and punishments. It's like a little child. We teach young children today the same manner. You behave properly. Here, right? Here, here, here's a, a reward. You don't. Here's not, you're not going to get the reward. Of course, in today's society, we want to give out the reward rather than behave or do not. <laughs> that usually is the issue, isn't it? So when they come over to grandparents, and grandparents have to you know, raise yeah, raise them, or say no, or say no they, they throw a hissy fit. Because my mother and father never say no. Because mother is trying to outdo father. Oh, did I step in there? Sorry. <laughs> However, the kind, highest kind of obedience is not based on a desire for reward or fair punishment. Oh, hallelujah. The highest kind of obedience is motivated by love. Amen. In his life and his teaching, Jesus tried to show the people that the inner spiritual blessings are far more important than material gains. God sees the heart. God wants to build the character out of that heart. Salvation is the gift of God in response to man's faith. Material riches are not a guarantee that God is pleased with man. So I'm sorry to burst your bubble. A person could be motivated by the heart of a servant through selflessness. Remember that funny word, folks? Remember, we... we, we we just kept on reading. We said selfishness. Um, no, selflessness. The servant in the history, in the story was evidently in Luke 17, 7 to 10, a jack of all trades. He was responsible for farming, shepherding, and cooking. That wouldn't be me. It was not unusual for people with only modest means to hire at least one servant. But Jesus described a situation which in that day was unthinkable. A master ministering to his servant. In fact, he introduced the story with the phrase that means, can any of you imagine? The answer had to be no. We cannot imagine such a thing. Because Jesus had already discussed his relationship to his servants and had promised to serve them if they were faithful. He himself was among them as a servant, even though he was the master of them all. This story emphasizes faithfulness to duty. No matter what the demands might be. 
And the argument is from the lesser to the greater. If a common servant is faithful to obey the orders of his master, who does not reward or even say thank you, how much more ought Christ's disciples to obey their loving master, who has promised to reward them gracefully? Have you ever had a, uh, had a conversation with individuals and they'll tell you, oh, my supervisor never say thank you. Why does he? When all that you do is show up for a paycheck. Why does he have to say thank you? So what then is the proper attitude for Christian service? My Bible tells me in Ephesians 6, 6, doing the will of God from the heart. Amen. I'm going to do everything from the heart. Amen. Bible said, if you love me, keep my commandments. To the person who is born again, his commandments are not grievous. Because serving the Lord Jesus is a delight. Not a duty. We obey it, excuse me, sorry, because we love it. Because why? I delight to do thy will, O oh God. This morning, Lord, as I wake up, I desire to do your will today. Yeah, what's your will? Drive that car out the garage, drop by and say hi to Sam, pick up my car, uh, Tim Hortons, off to work, make sure the electric bus is working, and I take off. <clears throat> is that all? <clears throat> no, meeting every child that enters the bus. Having an attitude of grace as they come in. Had a little chat with a, a young man that gets into the bus from another country and I just asked him, I said, when you go home at night, he said, I said, do you say hello to your parents when you walk in the house? He said, sometimes. I said, well, all I'm asking you when you step foot in this bus, say hello to the driver behind the seat, please. Mm -hmm. just, just be nice enough to say hello. Even if you don't give me a fist bump, just say hi. Open your mouth. You can speak. Say hello. You know he does it every time. And he feels good about it. He feels good about going home. And when he leaves the bus, he said goodbye. I said, well, I didn't teach him that one. Thank you, Lord. I just taught him the hello part. But he saw the other kids doing it. Are we motivated by humility? You know, we expect unsafe individuals to be selfish and grasping. You don't expect it of a believer who has experienced the love of Christ and the fellowship of the Spirit. But more than 20 times in the New Testament, God instructs us of how to live with one another. More than 20 times. We're to prefer one another. We're to edify one another. We're to bear each other's burdens. We should not judge one another, but we're to admonish one another. What does admonish mean? Encourage. Others is the key word in the vocabulary of the Christian who exercise the submissive mind. Then we're motivated by love. Love for God, love for people, love for God's house. Jesus, others, and you. What does it mean? Joy. And then we're motivated by being faithful. But a servant is constantly being judged. There's always somebody criticizing 
something that you do. So point, Paul pointed out that there are three judgments in the life of the steward. There's man's judgment. Paul did not get upset, 1 Corinthians chapter 4, sorry. Paul did not get upset when people criticize him. For he knew his master's judgment was far more important. Why do we get all upset and flipped out when somebody criticizes us? Somebody criticizes us and we want to, our backs against the wall and we got to prove what? How much we love them? Well, I love you so much. Here's my fivefold. I don't think so. And then there's the servant's own self judgment. Paul knew nothing that was amiss in his life and ministry, but even that did not excuse him. Sometimes you really don't know yourself until you're in a corner, you don't know where you are at until somebody puts you in a corner up against the wall and you want to come out swinging. So what's the fine line between a clear conscience and a self-righteous attitude? Beware. And then the most important judgment, and I like this, is God's judgment. God judges us today through his word by the ministry of the spirit and sometimes he uses the ministry of a loving friend to help us face and confess sin. But the main reference here is to the final evaluation when each Christian stands at the judgment seat of Christ. Whatever you do, you do as unto the Lord. So when you stand before Christ and he says, but you did it, but what was your attitude in doing it? Oh, I'm only doing this. I really don't care how I do it, how it gets done. I couldn't give two hoots about this boss, this boss who goes off to Florida every year. I don't know you guys. You understand what I'm saying? But you, you got this attitude, so I'm only doing it. Oh, I can't wait. I can't wait till I retire. Really? And the boss is going to be sitting down there. Oh. Really? You walk out the door, and he'll find a replacement for you very quickly. All right, okay. Now, the true facts will be revealed and the faithful servants will be rewarded. The local church is a family and members of the family must help each other to grow. There's a place for honest, loving criticism. It's found in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 15. If the critic is right, then he has helped us. If the credit is wrong, then we can help them. Either way, the truth is strength. Paul went on to say with a threefold rebuke. Here's the rebuke. First, you're judging God's servant at the wrong time. Second, you're judging by the wrong standard. And third, you're judging by the wrong motive. So when we judge each other, by what motive are we judging each other? According to our own or according to God's? I will want to judge according to God's word. Am I right? Yes. Amen. Now, to some people, God has given the ability to rule or to administer various functions of the church as we do have in this assembly. 
Whatever gift we have must be dedicated to God and used for the good of the whole body. It's tragic when any one gift is emphasized in a local church beyond all the other gifts. That's why Paul wrote, are all apostles? Are all prophets? Are all teachers? Are all workers of miracles, gifts of healing? Do all speak with tongues? Do all interpret? The answer to all these questions are no. Sorry, that was bad English. Questions is no. For a Christian to minimize the other gifts while he emphasizes his own gift is to deny the very purpose for which gifts are given. So we cannot minimize each other's gift. Oh, well, you only do this. Oh, by the way, you are only the usher. And what does that make you? So we don't minimize each other's gift. Spiritual gifts are tools to build with, not toys to play with or weapons to fight with. In the church at Corinth, the believers were tearing down the ministry because they were abusing spiritual gifts. They were using their gift as ends in themselves and not as means towards the end of building up the church. They so emphasized their spiritual gifts that they lost their spiritual graces. They had the gifts of the Spirit but were lacking in the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, etc. There's something that changed my whole entire life a couple of years ago, actually about it, two years ago, in how we used to do communion and fellowship. We all used to have communion on first Sunday, fellowship on third Sunday, until I came across Acts 2.42. The breaking of bread. Because the interpretation of that means <coughs> that it was at the close of each meal. They paused to remember the Lord by observing what we call the Lord's Supper. Supper. Bread and wine were the common fare at a Jewish table. And the word fellowship means much more than being together. It means having in common. And it means sharing material goods that were practiced in the early church. This was not a form of modern communism, for it was voluntary, total voluntary, it was temporary, but it was motivated by love. But in that, folks, when you see the depth of fellowship and the breaking of bread and the communion, the church was unified. The church was magnified. And the church was multiplied. Had a powerful testimony among the unsaved Jews, not only because of the miracles done by the apostles, but also because of the way that the members of the fellowship loved each other and served the Lord. The risen Lord continued to work with them and people continued to be saved. What a church. It didn't say that it all happened in the same place, just as this assembly could be anywhere in the world, right now, right now taking place anywhere in the world where someone that received 
good word, a good word from Bethel is applying that word to their ministry somewhere. So I end with this, Psalm 51. Create in me a clean heart, O God. Renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence. Do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me by your generous spirit. Then I will teach transgressions your ways and sinners shall be converted to you. Sinners shall be converted to you. How will we teach transgressors? By responding in the same manner? No. By over and abundance of the character that God has given us called love. Amen. We close for today. Amen.